Hi everyone, today I'm going to talk about the difference between being secular and being godly. And to be secular, according to the dictionary, secular means secular, relating to worldly things that are not regarded as sacred or spiritual, godly, conforming to God's will. So to be secular is to be independent from God and to be godly is to be dependent of God. What do I mean by this? To be secular means that maybe you might say a little prayer here and there. You might go to church every once in a while, but you don't care to do the will of God. You don't care to, to not sin against God. When you are godly, you care. If you sin against God, you feel bad because you offended him. It's like when you have a husband and you cheat on him. If you would be secular, this is a good parable actually, just, just out of it. If you would be secular, you wouldn't care to cheat on your husband. You're like, who cares? Taha. But if you would be godly, this is a parable, and you, you would never want to cheat on your husband. And if for whatever reason you do, you would feel such conviction and you would feel horrible. You would feel bad. So it's the same thing. It's when, when you care to have a relationship with God and when you don't care to have a relationship with God, when you care to please God and live by what he says and when, when you don't care. So that's the difference between being secular and being godly. Now in the book of James 4, 4 in the Bible, it says, you adulterous people, don't you know that fellowship with the world means enmity with God? And you may say, Sandra, what do you, what does the Bible mean by that? We all live in the world. But the Bible says that those that are redeemed by God, those that, who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they are live in the world, but they are not of the world. So there is a difference between being worldly and being godly. Being secular is being worldly. And in 1 Peter 1, 16, God says, he says to those that are his, his chosen, he says, be holy for I am holy. Why does God say this? Because if the only way you can come before God is when you've been washed, when you're holy, when, you, when, you, when you're walking in holiness, and I'm gonna give you an example. Does, we are made in God's image, right? And if you clean your bed sheets and you have beautiful, clean bed sheets, and someone comes filled with mud and nasty and sweaty, and you just put your bed sheets on the bed and they're clean, and they throw themselves on your bed, would you not get super upset and super mad because they're disgusting and they just dirtied your bed sheets? Yeah, you would get mad. So God is holy, therefore nothing filthy comes before him. It's not like the yin yang that there's a little bit of bad and good and there's a little bit of good and bad. No, when he's holy, he's holy. So in order for you to come before him, he washes you. But in order for him to wash you, you have to accept to be washed because he doesn't force anyone. So he says, here's a gift, I give it to you, the gift of salvation. You can be washed, you just have to make a decision. And once you make a decision, you can come before me. I, you know, I died, I gave my begotten, my, my only begotten son so that you can have access to me. But if you don't decide to leave sin behind, if you don't decide to be washed, then you can't have that relationship or fellowship with me. You know, it's, it's you're the one who chooses. God gives you the choice. He says, I, I've given you a choice. You have access to me. You just have to get washed. So now it, in... Um, in Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. I'm going to give you an example of this with Jesus. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. His flesh, he was hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. So what happens? The devil comes to him and he tempts him. And he says, If you are the son of God, turn this rock into bread. And Jesus was hungry. I'm sure Jesus wanted bread. But he resisted the temptation because he says not only will, and it's not that it's bad, it's that he was fasting. He was committed to a fast, where he didn't want to break it. He says not only will man live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the, of the mouth of God. So it shows you that sometimes in our spirit, we, we don't want to do something. Maybe, maybe someone is bound to drugs. They don't want to do drugs, but they're addicted. They're bound. They're a slave to the sin. So they say, you know, I don't want to do drugs anymore, but their flesh craves it. So there, therefore, there is a, a war between their spirit and their flesh. They do that which they don't want to do because they are a slave to that sin. And that's why the Bible says that, you know, either you're a slave of Christ or you're a slave of sin, either or. So, and, and this is why a lot of people, when they fast, people say, what is fasting on about? Why do you fast? One of the one of the purposes of fasting is to kill the flesh, is, is so that your flesh is weak, so that your spirit is stronger and is more able to perceive the things of the spirit of God. God of, of the spiritual realm so in Galatians 5 it says but the fruit of the spirit so now we see that there is characteristics of secular people and characteristics of godly people they don't act the same just like God and the devil don't act the same they're very different so in Galatians I'm gonna start with Galatians 5 19 it says the acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality impurity debauchery idolatry witchcraft hatred discord jealousy fits of rage selfish ambition dissensions fractions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
And it says in Galatians 5.22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with the passions and desires. Meaning that the people that are that are, live secular life, you can tell. Like you can see someone and you can say, wow, this person, they appear to be Christian because man, they're, you know, they, they, they're living holy. They, they want to seek God. They don't want to be in sin. And you can see someone else and be like, es está en el mundo pero super secular because they buy a, you see the, the flesh everywhere. <laughs> I mean, they show the flesh, you know. So there's differences. In Ephesians 2, 9, it says salvation is not a reward for the, for the good things that we have done so that no one can boast. Because a lot of people say, Sandra, but I'm good. I don't do anyone any harm. You know, I'm a good person. I have a good heart. But the Bible says it's not about being good so that no man can boast because no matter how good you are, you'll never be as good as God. You'll never reach the, the limit. Like, let's say that this is the goal in order for you to be as holy as God and for you to be able to inherit the kingdom of God or go into heaven. No matter how good you are, you'll never be as good. You're going to fall short. It says we all fall short of the, we all fall short, you know? So it's like if there's a race from, you have to swim from what? United States, from Florida to Cuba. You have to swim from Florida to Cuba. And maybe there's three, three, you know, competitors and they're getting ready to start. And one of them drowns right away. And the other two, oh, they beat them. They beat them. They're, oh my goodness, they're almost there. But one of them dies like, what, 20 miles before getting to Cuba. And then there's one that is winning. Oh my goodness, they're almost there. They're almost there. But they died 10 miles before getting to Cuba. Guess what? None of them made it. None of them were good enough. None of them were, were good enough to get to Cuba. And it's the same concept. None of us, no matter how good we are, no matter how good we are, we can never make it to heaven on our own. That's why Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man gets to the Father without me. He says, the only way you can make it is through me, like through accepting the gift that I've given you. So in Ephesians 2.12, um, it says that remember that at one time you were separated from Christ. Now what happens is when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He restores that relationship with Him. You're no longer separated. And it says that He gives you a new heart and you are born again. A lot of people don't understand the concept of what it means to be born again. When you are born again, that means that you no longer desire the things of the flesh. You no longer desire the things of the world. That's why a lot of people, maybe they were addicted to drugs and they come to Christ and they say, ever since I came to Christ, I've never touched a drug again. I've never touched alcohol again. I've never slept with a man for money again. That 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 nature that was in that person disappears because they're delivered. The evil spirits that would torment them now because Jesus came into that person's life, even though you don't see it, they left. Now, not everyone gets immediately delivered it depends on the person's revelation and the person's really when, when their intentions when they give themselves to god like are they really giving themselves to god because some people say yeah i accept you jesus but they don't really have the intentions of changing they just say it to say it so there's no real repentance there's no real repentance there's no real deliverance there's no real nothing um so so when you're when you're born again now it says that when you're born again and the holy spirit comes to live inside of you you don't no longer desire to do the things of the flesh you desire to do the thing the god's will you that's why a lot of people say oh but Sandra, it's so hard because when you come to god you can't do this and you can't do that and what they don't understand is when you come to god you no longer desire to do evil things you no longer desire to randomly sleep around with different people you no longer desire to get drunk or to do drugs you no longer desire to curse you no longer desire to like beat people up for no reason because you're angry and you're mad at the world you know there's that 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 nature that was inside of you is no longer there now the nature that god puts in you it's, it's a nature of, of good so now you desire to do the things of good and regardless people say oh yeah but when you come to god you have to do this and you have to do that but really when you're in the world you're a slave to sin you don't maybe you don't want to do drugs but you're bound to the drugs you you've tried to leave it and you can't so what's better to be a slave of God and, and to be doing a will that you desire to or to be doing something that you don't want to, that it's destroying you? You know, when, when you're in the world, maybe you say, man, I don't want to drink anymore, but you continue to do it. I don't want to gamble anymore, but you're continuing to do it. I don't want to sleep around for money anymore, but you're continuing to do it. I don't want to curse, but it's, your, it's in your nature. It's something that it's the Bible says that. You know, you're, when you're a slave to sin, you're a slave to sin. You're bound. It's something stronger than you. It's something spiritual something that it's spiritual it manifests in the natural but it's something spiritual so this is the difference between secular and godly secular more selfish godly more giving more humble secular uh, secular more vanity more lust more flesh godly more more 
like reserved more i don't know like it's it's completely different it's it's like black to white you know so anyway i just want to put it out there I, I put it in my heart to talk about this because I was a friend mentioned something about the differences between secular we were talking about it and and even you can see it in even in marriages even in relationships the difference between a godly marriage and a secular marriage the difference between godly men and secular men the difference between godly women and secular women and so forth so anyway I hope you enjoyed this little thing I, I guess if you want to give me feedback I'm fine <laughs> I'll receive feedback